Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wednesday Population Health Webinar. This is Meredith Maynard, Director of Quality here at Utica Park Clinic, and Terry Hillsbury, who is our coding educator um, within our quality department. We're going to take the next 20, 25 minutes to just give a real high level overview of Medicare risk adjustment. I know many of you have probably heard about Medicare risk adjustment and HCC scoring over the last probably five to seven years. But we want to give just another overview and talk about some of the new tools that are available in EPIC to help you identify some of these HCC scores. So, really quickly, you may have heard a lot of different letters, MRA, RAF, or RAF, HCC. Um, I know some people have come back and said, what do all these letters even mean? So we just want to give a real quick definition of this. So MRA is the Medicare Risk Adjustment. And this is the entire process. So the process of looking at Medicare patients, assigning a risk, and um, communicating that back to CMS and back to us. So this is not, when we talk about risk, I know you guys hear a lot of different risk values. You hear about lay scores. You hear about moderate risk and different CPC assignments. So this is completely different from that. This is a score that's assigned by CMS. Um, the actual RAF score, RAF stands for Risk Adjustment Factor, and this is the actual score that's assigned through the process to each member. And then HCC stands for Hierarchical Condition Categories. And this is the actual group of diagnoses that we look at that carry a weight. Terry, tell us how many categories of diagnoses there are. Currently, there are 79 categories. Next year, there'll be 83 categories, and that consists of 9,500 diagnosis codes. So just a handful of diagnosis codes. And it seems to just increase every year. So why is Medicare risk adjustment important? Well, that RAF score, the Risk Adjustment Factor score that we talked about previously, is assigned to each patient, accurately describes your patient's health status. And so we can look at 1.0 kind of being the midpoint or the average. And then as you go to the left, you go lower scores, indicate that your patient is more healthy. If you go to the right, as the higher the scores go, um, indicates that they have more chronic conditions um, with that member. Uh, Oklahoma, in general, over the last few years, has had an average Medicare score of less than 1.0. I think it was like 0.89 about four years ago. So we know that in Oklahoma, our health outcomes are not that good. We would anticipate that our patients would have more chronic conditions, such as diabetes and hypertension, and our average would tend to weigh to the right. So this is not just an issue that Utica Park Clinic has had. But across the state, we're realizing that we're not accurately describing our patient's health status back to Medicare. Mm -hmm. So why do we even care? Well, the MRA process determines the Medicare budget to care for your patient. So for instance, our Medicare Advantage plans submit these risk scores to Medicare, and then Medicare gives them the money to take care of those patients. And if that, if that score is low, then they're not going to get the budget that would adequately take care of that patient. So how is the RAF score even calculated? Well, the diagnoses that you submit from face-to-face -face visits have, that have a weight are added to disease interaction additives, and then CMS adds in another layer of demographic data, which looks at gender, um, age, whether they're in the community setting or an institutional setting, and all of those sum together to give the risk adjustment factor. So Terry, can you tell us a little bit more about on the diagnosis piece who's eligible, what kind of um, encounters those come from. Those uh, are determined from face-to-face -face visits from eligible providers. An eligible provider is anyone within their scope of practice who can diagnose a patient. Those face-to-face -face visits can include hospitalization, and it is not specialty specific. What about lab and x-ray? We tack on diagnoses to those. Do those count? Unfortunately, uh, diagnoses uh, from lab and x-ray do not count. So we found this really cool tool. So if you're really interested in what your 
potential score may be. We don't have a tool within EPIC because we don't have that additional information built into any sort of decision making. Hopefully, at some point that might come into play. But you can kind of play around with this um, calculator. Just Google HCC University Risk Score Calculator will be the first thing that comes up, or I can send you the link. But you just click in there, demographic risk factors. You put in, like we said, either their community or institutionalized. And obviously, if they're dual eligible, they're going to have a higher risk. So we actually picked a sample patient out of EPIC um, and plugged in their information. So she was a member of the community. She was non-dual. She had Medicare due to being aged, not disabled. And she had original Medicare eligibility due to disability. No, we, we made the assumption on that piece. And then we took three of her diagnoses. And so you can see this is what you would capture with your documentation and what you submit on a claim. So each one of these are weighted. So you have an HCC weight associated with these diagnoses. And then this information is submitted to CMS. So down here you can see here's the risk factor that is added because of her gender and age and her healthcare setting. And then the next one has the summation of the diagnoses that you submitted. And then those interaction additives that we referenced on that um, calculation previously. So because she is has CHF and diabetes, there's an additional scoring. And then because she has heart failure and COPD, there's an additional scoring. And then it gives us the total risk factor. You can see just with these three diagnoses alone, that put her above that 1.0 threshold that we're looking at when we're looking at our members. So it wasn't a lot of complicated diagnoses. It's just capturing what's going on with this patient and what you're managing. Terry, anything you want to add related to this calculator or some of the diagnosis codes that we put in there? Just that we need to be sure that we um, diagnose those diagnoses each calendar year. Right. Because Medicare just wipes the slate clean at the end of the year, right? Correct. And so even um, amputations, ostomies, things like that that don't go away, we still need to recapture every year. So how does the RAF score apply to us? Again, why do we care about this? So it determines our medical loss ratio. And when we talk about value-based programs, we talk about cost over quality equals value. And where does that cost come from? How do they determine if this is an accurate cost? So on the left, you'll see so for a patient, and the cost estimate for the patient is determined at $1,000 per month based on the RAF score. And then we would subtract the actual cost to care for that patient. Say it was $900 a month then we would be a surplus of $100 per month. So we came under what was estimated as the budget for that patient. So that puts us at a 90% medical loss ratio. Same patient, say we skip over to the right side, and the scoring is not as high. Say they're just allotted $600 per month based on the RAF score, minus the actual cost of $900, and you can see we um, are in a deficit of $300, and that puts our MLR at 130%, our medical loss ratio. So when a Medicare Advantage plan sees this, or even an innovative program like CPC, they're going to say, well, why are we spending more money on this patient that was not that ill? What, what happened? So there's always going to be exceptions or, or, or deviations, but in general, we would expect that we should come in around 100% or less for the medical loss ratio. Um, so that's how they determine if we fall into a shared savings category, um, if that money can be, sometimes we share in that surplus and those, that money can be reinvested in services that we can provide for our patients. This is the exact reason why Blue Cross decided not to contract with us with the Medicare Advantage plan. Our medical loss ratio was consistently above 100%. And so for them, they were not being funded to take care of our patients appropriately, and they couldn't continue to do business that way. And so you might have seen an impact on your patients. They may have had to pick another Medicare Advantage plan. They may have had to pick a different provider that was part of a different plan. So that's why this is really important to us. Even if there's no direct reimbursement issue for us, this does um, affect our participation in value-based programs and with our Medicare Advantage program. So now what? We find that this is so important. We wanted to highlight some tools within EPIC. So Terry may have been out with each of you in the last few weeks visiting about some of these, but she's going to give you an overview of what some of the tools are. So Terry, tell us about the flags and the BPAs that are in EPIC. 
So the FYI flags, the HCC query flags, you can find out if a patient has one by looking at the top of the banner at the top, or perhaps on the left-hand side if you've made the FYI the favorite. So those uh, are created based on information from our commercial Medicare Advantage care, care plans. They send a spreadsheet each month and they indicate, hey, this diagnosis has not been coded for this current calendar year. So what we've done is we've went in and we've built these flags so that you would be able to see them at the time of service so the patient can be assessed and we can close that gap. Um, their information comes from claims data, so it may contain information that UPC has not billed in the past. Uh, perhaps they're being seen um, by another healthcare provider with another uh, healthcare facility. The BPAs are for our traditional and commercial Medicare plans, and these are, look at what UPC billed last year, and they're saying, hey, we haven't, you haven't billed it this year. So they are available, again, for both traditional and commercial plans. Perfect. Pre-visit planning. In the past, you've had a pre-visit planning form from FITEL, and on those, you might have remembered seeing an HCC um, section, and so it told you exactly what Terry referenced in the BPAs. It told you what was coded last year, what needs to be coded this year, and then we also used that notes section to capture now what we're putting in the FYI flag. So instead of having to look at a different piece of paper, now you have it right at the point of service. Um, when you're seeing that patient. We're also looking at, a, um, Population Health is re looking at revamping the pre-visit planning forms by building some reports in EPIC, so those will be coming soon. Another report that we can use to help capture these um, outstanding HCC diagnoses is the HCC refresh report. Terry, can you tell them where they can find that and what information is in there? Um, some of you can find it on the Population Health dashboard or we can also find that in our library by searching HCC Refresh Report. This report tells us which uh, patients have open gaps or codes or diagnoses that have been, not been coded this current calendar year. This gives us a list of people that perhaps we can call and schedule an appointment to get them in so that you can um, assess that condition and get that gap closed. Perfect. And then um, one of the best resources is here sitting right with me presenting today. Terry um, Hillsbury, this is her primary job is to help educate physicians and staff on the HCC process and how to capture these. So she is available to come out and give at the elbow support, show you more about where to find these FYI flags or the BPAs, answer your questions about HCC diagnoses. Managers, care managers, if you're interested in pulling this refresh report, she can come out and help build that specifically to your department and make sure that we're capturing everything we need. So please feel free to reach out to her for additional information. So documentation, we, um, th you know, this is where it comes down to the most important part of all of this. So we've given you an overview, but, but what do we do once we've given all this information, once we see the BPA, how do we document this so that we can capture and submit it to CMS? So Dr. Resnick, I have a, a little bio of him right here that you can read. Um, within the presentation, but I'm going to show a excerpt of a of a um, explanation that he gives of Medicare risk adjustment, and it's specifically about documentation. And I find the whole presentation is really great. If you want to go back and listen to it, the links there as well. But I'm going to share um, like a quick 10 minutes of this around documentation. Status or condition, stable conditioning, worsening, labs or test ordered, medications adjusted, and then a plan of action. COPD stable, continue current medications. You have to have all three of these. Why are documentation and specificity important? Look at it. Hepatitis C, unspecified, no RAF. Hepatitis C, acute, no RAF because you haven't mentioned any kind of treatment or, or whatever usually when you uh, use that diagnosis. Chronic. Hepatitis B implies that there's some ongoing surveillance, there's some ongoing tra uh, treatment, and now your RAF score is 0.165 because you've uh, hit a category HCC 29. Almost every RAF lecture you go to talks about the meat, and the meat is monitor, you want to look at the signs and symptoms, evaluate the test results, medication effectiveness, response to treatment, you want to assess and address, ordering tests, discussion, review, 
your records, counsel? You want to treat medication, therapies, and other modalities. You have to have the meat. Now, it's kind of corny, but this is the one the thing that I tell people is, without the meat, CMS can find you guilty of deceit, and this can land you in their hot seat. But the reality is there are audits on these charts. You have to make sure you're doing this appropriately and not uh, coding without the appropriate, uh, appropriate documentation. So your progress notes, you must evaluate each diagnosis on the progress note. It has to be face-to-face, -face, and you cannot refer to a problem list as documentation. So you want to use diabetes with neuropathy, stable, mental justice, COPD, PFD order, refer to pulmonary, hypertension, uncontrolled, add medication. These are perfect examples. Diagnosis is listed on the progress note without an evaluation or assessment is considered a problem list. It does not provide the correct documentation. So, the other thing it doesn't is probable, suspected, and possible. Do not code non-definitive conditions. Probable, possible, questionable, rule out, they don't code, they don't wrap, you can't use them. Code the condition always to the highest degree of specificity. Nine symptoms, abnormal tests, other reasons for the visit, always do the highest degree of specificity. So, history of indicates condition no longer exists. Pay special attention to list headers such as uh, past medical history. You don't want to refer to that. So instead of documenting history of diabetes, you want to say patient with diabetes since 2009. History of CH, medicine with LASIK, you want to say compensated CHF stable on LASIK. History of COPD, meds, Advair, controlled COPD with Advair. If it's not documented in the medical record, then it did not happen. Other uh, linkage type verbiage that CMS looks for is due to, because of, related to. Those are all acceptable. What's not acceptable is the word with, except diabetes with retinopathy, diabetes with renal manifestation, diabetes with neuropathy. That is acceptable. Every year, like we said, things reset. You have to remember the things that are ongoing. You know, the transplant, if they had a transplant, you want to mention that because they didn't have to have a transplant this year to qualify. That transplants for quadriplegia, same thing, dialysis status. If they have an ostomy, an amputation, even HIV infection, people forget that. You know, they may be asymptomatic, their titers are negative, uh, but you have to mention that. And you have to document it, and you have to document a treatment. So we talked about Well, I think that Dr. Rasnick just does a fantastic job of explaining um, what, how to document. And so I think if you're interested in more information, and that was about a four minute snippet from his 30 minute presentation, and he goes into much more detail, but it's a great starting place and some great takeaways that, um, that maybe you can apply in the documentation process. So this pretty much wraps up our webinar for today. Feel free to reach out to Terry if you would like uh, more information, if you'd like for her to come out to the clinic and show you some of those tools that we highlighted today, we'd be happy to do that. We thank you for your time today and have a great rest of your Wednesday.